Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, um, and welcome to Ag Research's webinar on quality forage for cost control. My name is Jerry Boyle, and I'm chairman of Ag Research. And I'm coming to you this evening from West Tipperary. I hope the weather is a bit better across Northern Ireland than it is down here or has been for the last couple of weeks. Ag Research, as you probably are aware, is an organization funded by Northern Ireland farmers to promote and exploit research and innovation for the benefit of Northern Ireland farmers. I don't have to tell uh, our viewers this evening that of course the sector across the country is experiencing a deterioration in price circumstances and relative to March of last year, for example, in the dairy sector, there has probably been a 30% deterioration in the cost of feed to price ratio. And of course, beef and sheep farmers are always challenged when it comes to dealing with tight margins. So we hope that we hope that the topic of this evening's web webinar will be of interest to all uh, dairy, beef and sheep farmers, because there's absolutely no doubt that the resilience of the sector, when faced with tight margins, is very much dependent on the ability to grow, uh, to produce quality forage and grow plenty of it. So this evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have five excellent speakers. And um, our first two speakers will present short presentations, about 15 minutes each. And our speakers are, first of all, Dr. Debbie McConnell, who's now um, working with Lakeland Dairies. And Debbie will be followed by Mr. Jason McMinn, who is an independent consultant and also a farmer in his own right. And immediately after these two presentations, we'll give an opportunity to all of you to ask any questions of, that you might have for uh, Debbie or Jason. And I would ask you to use the Q&A box there on your screens um, if you have any questions. And then following those questions on the first two papers, we'll have a, a panel discussion, which will be, per, um, will, will be comprising three well-known uh, dairy beef and sheep farmers. And that panel discussion will be facilitated by Dr. St. Clair Main. Um, and we have three speakers lined up for that discussion, as I said, Gary Thompson, who is a dairy farmer from Ballymoney. And he's also chairman of the Ag Research Dairy Advisory Committee. We also have Sam Chesney, a well-known beef and sheep farmer from Kirkcobbin. And of course, he's also a board member of Ag Research. And finally, we have James Henderson, a beef and sheep farmer from Kilkeel. And um, he's very much involved in the Agri-Search Grass Check and Beacon Farm Network programs. So with those words of introduction, and again, reminding you, uh, if you have the questions, and please, we would welcome questions, of course, and lots of them, use the Q&A box. Our first speaker, will be uh, Debbie McConnell. Over to you, Debbie, in your own time. Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak um, this evening. Um, what I really wanted to touch on here was to follow up on some work that we did last year, looking at the cost effectiveness of fertilizer um, and its role in our forage systems here in Northern Ireland, because we are in, in very different economic climate now than we were um, to probably uh, 14 uh, or 16 months ago. And also then to just take a quick look at really how we can maximize um, and make the most most of our grazing and silage systems and to ensure that we really keep um, input costs under control and protect and, and effectively produce high quality forages um, in a cost effective manner. 
So as Jerry alluded to, uh, it has been a significantly uh, uh, volatile last uh, couple of uh, years, I suppose, in terms of both commodity prices, um, both uh, for inputs um, and for um, the likes of uh, meat and milk prices as well. And within Northern Ireland, we've certainly um, been exposed to that. Um, we do uh, rely on quite significant inputs of both feedstuffs and fertilizers. We um, purchase about 1.43 million tonnes of feedstuffs, ruminant feedstuffs every year that are delivered onto farms here uh, in the north and about 340,000 tonnes of fertiliser come in each year as well. So we are significantly exposed to the volatility that we do see in input prices. And you can see the trends that we have um, been very made very well aware of in the last couple of years in terms of these commodity prices there in the graphs at the bottom. The graph on the bottom left is fertilizer prices since 2016 and the graph on the right is grain and protein prices um, over the same time period and you can see since 2021 onwards we have seen significant price rises in both uh, feedstuffs and fertilizer as well um, and although there's been a wee bit of easing in those to date, we are um, always going to be exposed to volatility in both of these prices. And so it's really important we use those as cost effectively as possible. But in Northern Ireland, we do have that wonderful advantage of having the potential to grow and utilise high quality forages. Um, we don't need to look too much further than grass check to be able to see that, you know, year on year, we can produce, consistently produce yields of high quality grass. The grass check plots show that on average, we're producing about 11.5 tonne of dry matter per hectare. Now, our, you know, granted last year, we did had considerably lower yields because of drought, drought but we are, um, we still can produce good quality yields of, of grass and, or, and high volume yields of grass. And that's echoed as well on farm as well. The grass check farms um, have an average yield last year of 11.4 tonne of dry matter per hectare. Um, so we are ha we do have a competitive advantage against other sort of dairy and meat production regions across the world to have a high volume of homegrown forages and they are relatively cost effective um, if we look at the graph on the bottom right hand side we can see that the full economic cost of producing a ton of grazed grass roughly at the moment is probably in around about 88 pounds per ton dry matter two cut silage system 111 pounds per ton dry matter and a three cut silage system in in terms of 139 pounds per tonne dry matter. That's using current oil and uh, fertilizer prices accounted for that. You compare that uh, uh, versus bought in feedstuffs and there has been a wee bit of easing in terms of feed prices, but we're still probably talking somewhere in the region of about 400 to 420 pounds per tonne dry matter of feedstuff for a good quality dairy concentrate. So there is certainly significant gains to be made by maximizing our use of homegrown forages but really, how do we make the most of that price differential? Well, when we are producing our homegrown forages, it's about producing them as cost effectively as possible. And really, that means making sure we are using nitrogen efficiently. Nitrogen does remain a key element in the production of both our grazing and uh, silage systems. It's absolutely essential um, for supporting grass growth, but it is a high cost. It typically accounts for about 60% of the cash costs of producing grass in a grazing system. It's a bit lower in silage systems, roughly about 30 to 40%, but still a significant component of the cost of our grass production systems. So it's something we want to make sure that we are using cost effectively. Now, it will be important to us going forward if we're looking to maintain high yields of grass. Um, some work done at AFBE has shown the impacts of reducing nitrogen fertilizer application rates on overall grass yield. And some farmers may have chosen to do that last year with the cost of fertilizer at the time. So in 2021, if we look at the uh, table on the bottom right hand side, we had grass grown uh, under a standard application rate of 270 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. Um, there was plots that were grown under 135 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. And then in 2022, the same rates of nitrogen fertilizer were applied um, and a further rate of 67.5 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare uh, was added to that as well. And what 
we can see is 2021 by reducing our fertilizer down, uh, we did have a reduction um, in fertilizer and uh, grass yields um, from about 2.6, uh, sorry, 2.4 ton of dry matter per hectare, so about 76% gra less grass. And in 2022, by dropping from 270 to 135, we uh, reduced our grass yield um, by about 20%. And if we reduced it by about 40% if we drop from 270 to 67.5. And you can see the shape of the grass growth curve there on the right hand side with that reduction in growth really being evident in the first part of the season. Now, because we had a drought last year, the impacts of reduced fertilizer are likely to be dampened a little bit um, on into July and August, um, but certainly we do see the impact of those lower end application rates there. So if we are going to use nitrogen, it's really important that we use it as cost effectively as possible and we make sure that we are getting um, our bang for our buck in terms of our grass growth response. Um, and when we look at um, nitrogen and, and assessing the role of nitrogen, we quite often talk about grass growth response as a way of evaluating how effective that fertilizer has been. And the grass growth response to fertilizer, so that's effectively how many kilos of grass, dry matter we get for every kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer that we apply, is influenced by a range of factors that can vary significantly between farms or as we've seen with the drought last year from season to season. But typically what we tend to find is that application, as fertilizer application rate increases, our nitrogen response decreases. So if we look at the graph on the right hand side, if we were to apply about 150 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, because in that scenario, nitrogen is really the limiting factor to grass growth, for every one kilogram of nitrogen that we apply, we get about 26 kilograms of grass dry matter yield back. If we increase it to 300 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, we, for every one kilogram of nitrogen extra that we're applying in that scenario, we're only getting about 15 kilos of grass back. And if we increase it again to 450 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, for every one kilogram of N extra that we're applying there, we're only getting about five kilograms of grass dry dry matter back and that's because of those higher nitrogen application rates other factors such as temperature and soil moisture can become limiting so really what we're seeing from this graph that it are, in terms of our sweet spot for producing high volumes of grass but cost effectively we are looking to get a response rate of about 20 kilograms of, of grass dry on our back for every one kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer that we apply and that's something that we have seen time and time again from our grass check plot so it, we know it's achievable um, to, to do that in Northern Ireland. And then importantly, what we want to do is just look at the cost benefit of that. Um, what we want to, or, uh, what we've done really this time, uh, sort of 14 months ago, was look at the cost benefit of fertilizer application versus the feed value of grass um, produced to really give us an indication as to how much fertilizer pr prices are impacting um, grass production um, and whether or not it's cost effective to be applying at higher uh, fertilizer prices. So to do that, we to look at the cost benefit of fertilizer application, we really said, um, what is the cost of one kilogram of applying one kilogram nitrogen fertilizer and uh, what is the respective feed value of the 20 kilograms of grass produced from that one kilogram uh, of nitrogen fertilizer. And we put those in a ratio and where we had values that were greater than one, the grass feed value was greater than the fertilizer cost. And where we had values less than one, grass feed value is less than the fertilizer cost. And we have updated those figures to see where we are. But really the story that has come out um, from looking at that analysis 14 months ago and again um, today is really that um, fertilizer application um, under good grass growth response conditions is very cost effective. The graph on the right hand side here shows the uh, curve for both urea and can at different fertilizer prices. So as different fertilizer prices rise from 400 pounds to 1000 pounds a tonne of product on the bottom of the graph, we can see the grass value fertilizer cost ratio 
embryo uh, up on the y-axis of the graph. And we can see that, yes, as fertilizer price rises, the grass uh, value fertilizer cost ratio decreases. So, for example, if we move from can at 450 pounds a ton, the grass value there is worth 3.7 times that of the fertilizer cost. But if we move to 750 pound a ton, that drops to 2.3 times um, the fertilizer cost. However, really what we're seeing is that under good grass growth response condition, curves very much remain above that critical value of one, um, where the grass value is worth more than the fertilizer cost. So respect and respect to uh, concentrate prices at the minute, still uh, uh, fer uh, fertilizer um, is cost effective when we get a good grass growth response. But the question then is what happens if we don't get a good grass response? What cost can that put on our forage production systems? And we might not get a good grass response for a whole range of reasons. For example, soil health, if we have impaired so soil biological activity, impaired soil chemistry, if we have poor soil structure, all of those have been shown in countless studies to impact on how efficiently nitrogen fertilizers are used. A great example of that is somewhere done by Michael Egan in Chuggas, who showed that when soil pHs was, were between five and five and a half, really we're talking about 32% of fertilizer being wasted. Um, we're only talking about 77% of all the nitrogen that's been applied actually being utilized. So we're, 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 reduction, we're reducing our grass growth response there by almost 25% where we have got poor sward composition, where we've got more native grasses in there, but particularly where we've got a high level of weeds, we can see grass yields reduced easily by 10 to 20% uh, at relatively low levels of weed infestation. So that will again impact on our nitrogen uh, response or our grass yield response to nitrogen. And what we've certainly seen over the last couple of years are the impact of application conditions um, uh, or weather conditions at the timing of application on grass response to nitrogen. For example, in March, we can see grass growth rates of anywhere between two and a half to 35 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. Um, this spring has no, been no different in the volatility that we have seen. Um, in July, we've seen growth rates in even in single figures and up to 93 kilograms of dry matter per hectare under the grass check monitoring program. So huge variation there. And those weather conditions will really impact are obviously putting a uh, having a strong impact on how much grass can be grown, and that will impact on our nitrogen uh, response as well, and could and can significantly bring that grass growth response from 20 kilograms of dry grass dry matter per kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer applied down to 15 kilos or less. And what is the economic impact of doing that? Well, if our grass growth response falls from 20 kilograms uh, per of grass for every one kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer applied down to 15, we can see that the cost of producing grass, grazed grass rises from 88 to 103 pounds a ton. Our two cut silage system, every ton of dry matter of grass becomes about 22 pounds more expensive. And on a three cut silage system, that then becomes about 28 pounds a ton more expensive because we're putting in the same inputs, but we're not getting the same yield back. So we're losing out there in terms of the production of grass. But we've also got the extra cost because um, we are seeing reduced yields in that 15 kilograms of grass growth response compared to our 20. Um, so in grazing systems, that typically is around about a ton and a half um, of lost dry matter per hectare, which might sound, not sound like much, but if we have a 40 hectare grazing platform, we didn't need an extra 5.5 hectares more land to deliver that extra grass. Um, and in the silage system, we're losing about two ton of dry matter per hectare if we're not getting the same response. And so we're we're needing about six and a half hectares more land. So we've got the added cost of extra land, added cost of producing that extra forage, and the more expense, um, uh, expensive uh, cost to producing the forage that we're currently producing if we're not getting a good uh, nitrogen response. So certainly maximizing nitrogen response can significantly lower forage costs and reduce uh, land requirements. So when we're talking about uh, making a uh, cost, sort of quality forage for um, cost control, certainly we do want to be looking at our forage production inputs and making sure that we're getting the maximum bang for our buck with those. 
If we also start to think then about grass utilization and making sure we're producing the best quality forage, this is really key to making sure that we are um, um, getting the biggest bang for our buck in terms of replacing concentrates and cutting down on imported feedstuff costs. And we know that silage quality is absolutely key um, uh, to uh, ensuring that we are reducing our concentrate requirements. Um, and at this particular time of the year, um, certainly uh, the time and the stage of the plant when we cut um, has a big influence on the quality of that silage. Each unit increase in silage D value is worth about 0.3 to 0.4 kilos of milk per cow per day. So it's really valuable um, if we can cut, make high quality silage. At this time of the year, a delay in harvesting from one week from midway onwards typically results in a reduction in D value of up to three units. And we can see that on the graph on the right hand side, the monitor digestibility of forages, a first cut silage from the 28th of April right through to the middle of June. And you can see from the middle of May there can start to drop off really in silage quality. And typically silage D value when in around when 50% of seed have, heads are evident is around about 67 uh, as, a, as a rule of thumb. And some work that was done by uh, AFB recently to look at the impact of D value on uh, animal production um, shows really clearly and nicely actually how important it is in terms of uh, cow yields and uh, total dry matter intake. The table at the bottom here shows low D value versus high uh, D value forages. So uh, animals were fed a silage of low D value of 67 D value versus uh, a 75 D value silage. And we can see that over the study period, the, uh, the dairy cows uh, increased uh, dry matter intake by about 3.7 kilos uh, per cow per day. That was followed by a corresponding milk yield increase of about 6.3 kilos per cow per day and an increase in fat plus protein yield by 0.6 kilos uh, per cow per day. So we know if we can produce better quality forages, we can reap the returns in terms of animal performance. But we also want to look at the whole silage picture um, and some people have uh, certainly expressed more of an interest in multi-cut silage systems uh, recently. And following on from the previous study, uh, we have done some work involving uh, 80, 80 uh, dairy cows, um, looking at the impacts of a three versus four cut silage system. And very much we see something similar here again. In a four cut silage system, we are uh, achieving higher quality silage um, with a higher crude protein content and um, with a lower fiber level. So NDF levels are lower. Um, and because of that, we are achieving good cow performance. So if the table on the bottom right hand side shows um, cow performance performance under the three and four cut silage management system. So dry matter intake was increased by about 0.9 kilos per cow per day. Concentrate dry matter intake was reduced slightly by about 0.3 kilos per cow per day. Milk yield was increased by 2.4 kilos per cow per day and overall fat plus protein yield uh, increased as well. So overall cow performance uh, was uh, better under our four cut silage system. However, the caveat with that is that we did have reduced yields evident from the four cut system. They produced uh, and under the three cut system, we produced 13.4 tonnes of dry matter per hectare on under the four cut system, it was 12.4 tonnes of dry matter per hectare. And so that meant that although we had a 2.2% reduction in concentrate feed um, over the study, that for a hot butt. Uh, for 100 cows over 180 day winter and the, the, under a four cut silage system there'd be a requirement for almost 10% more silage and an extra requirement of about 20% more land to be able to produce um, that forage. So when we're looking at cost effective utilisation of forages it's important that we look at producing high quality forages but at the whole system as well and what it would take um, to produce that higher quality silage. Just to finish off, um, because I am conscious uh, of time um, and grazing systems as well, it's really important that we do uh, maximise, try and maximise the value we can get from forages um, by maximising grass intakes. Now, we know that under good grazing conditions, grass intakes in excess of 16 kilograms of grass dry matter per cow per day can be achieved. Um, but really, it is about managing, managing these systems well to achieve that. Grass intake is 
influenced by a range of things, grass dry matter content, uh, grass alliance, um, what concentrate feed rate and, and type. And we could actually probably spend a whole webinar talking about um, each of these different variables. But I think if anything really uh, stands out here, looking at the grass check farm data set from last year, it's the importance of pre-grazing cover. Um, those farms shows that we consistently can produce and utilize high volumes of grass by maintaining and, you, and going into good pre-grazing covers of 29 and around the region of sort of 2900 uh, to 3150 uh, was what was achieved last year on average on the beef dairy and sheep farms uh, onto the grass check program and that has really helped lead to high utilization rates of grass and helped maximize uh, grass intakes in that system. So just to finish off um, really um, despite rising input costs um, uh, both graze and ensile forages remain the most cost effective feedstuffs available to Northern Ireland farms and the ratio of grass value to fertilizer costs is very much positive. However, as margins tighten on farm, it's important to ensure that we get maximum response from any fertilizer applied through good management practices. So making sure our soil health is optimum, we get our timing of fertilizer uh, right and our grass utilization is good. When we're looking at high quality silage systems, um, it's really important that we do focus on quality um, to ensure and support good animal performance. However, we do need to look at the whole system and how we're going to achieve um, that high quality silage. And then within grazing systems, targeting high grass dry matter intakes, focusing on targeting pre and post grazing covers. And I would say looking to the grass check farms uh, as well will give a really good indication as to how we can maximize the grass in those systems. I'll hand back to you, Jerry. Right. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks, Debbie. And that was really a, an excellent rundown of uh, of the key issues in relation to grassland uh, management. I, I was struck by there were several things in your presentation, but uh, I was struck by your calculation that a reduction of about two ton in dry matter yield per hectare was the, of course, the equivalent of finding under six and a half hectares of land. I think that will help focus the mind. Um, can I just remind everyone again, please, to use the Q&A box uh, on your screen, not the chat function for, um, for your questions, of which I'm sure you'll have many. Our next speaker now is Jason McMinn. And as I said earlier, Jason is an independent consultant and also a farmer. So Jason, over to you, please. Jason McMinn from uh, my business, Farm Grade Consultancy Limited. I'm working with uh, a number of dairy farmers here in Northern Ireland, uh, a couple across the border as well, uh, mostly on business type issues. And uh, uh, I, I'm also uh, recording grass here for Grass Check as well. Um, so trying to work a bit at the cold face as well. Um, so this is my title. Uh, Produce and utilize high quality forage for efficient performance and financial returns. Um, I think one of the building blocks of uh, profitable farming is maximizing your own resources. And uh, in there, we have to, as Debbie said, we've got to grow as much grass on all our farms, whether we're beef, sheep, or dairy, um, each year. Uh, and uh, keep it weed free, keep the lime, keep the pHs and so on and, and maximize our, that's number one I think for grass based farm, we grow as much grass as we can and then we want to utilize it as much as we can. Um, the, uh, so maximizing your own resources, um, well it's a no nutshell, better quality forage. We've, we've heard there about the, the different, the two cuts versus three cuts versus four cuts. It's uh, a constant topic of discussion among dairy farmers and where to draw the line and how many cuts to go for. Um, and uh, we can see the results in terms of fat and protein and milk yield. But uh, I think, uh, I think the, the, when it comes to reseeding here, the, the, one of the issues I see quite often nowadays is their the high level of stocking rates in many farms. And there's a challenge to take out ground for reseeding. And when we're in that position, we need to think, 
uh, we could be affecting our the growth of grass on our farm, the quality of grass on our farm, or, or, or other forages indeed, if we can't afford to take out land for reseeding. So we have to think of stocking rates as well in all this picture, which come into play when we get dry spells and even wet spells. We've had a, a wet spring and it's a challenge. Um, I'm not going to mention lime. Debbie's already covered it. On the slurry additives front, um, <clears throat> just on farm level there, I'm not uh, a researcher or anything, but uh, I've been sampling some slurry which has been treated with slurry bugs and uh, um, some results have come out quite good. Uh, and uh, I'm talking to my clients about this. When fertilizer is expensive, we could be looking into the lack of slurry additives as a way to perhaps reduce our fertilizer usage a little bit. Uh, we may lack a little research in it, but uh, um, there may be research they're not aware of, but I have some results of our, from, our, from my own clients and uh, there, there are certain brands that I'm happy enough to recommend. When it comes to maize silage, there's a move back towards maize. It disappeared there for 10 years. The key thing with maize, I think, is that uh, the yield and where we are in this country is uh, we're marginal for maize. Some places are all right. I think that um, if you want to grow maize silage, <clears throat> you've got to have uh, a southerly facing site. You've got to have um, you've, you've got to have, I think, more towards the east of the province where there are more sunshine hours, um, and you've got to be low latitude. Um, and the reason I mention maize is that when I looked at figures last year in 2022, when contracting costs for three cups of grass shot up so much, when fertilizer uh, shot up so much as well, as we all know, and we compared that with maize, where you didn't have as much fertilizer needed, you had only one cut. Uh, the differential in cost between maize and grass silage narrowed quite a bit on my figures. And we had a few people did it. Uh, and did okay. It was a good year for maize. The problem is it's, it's weather dependent. There are some years that maize has failed, as we all know. So, uh, But the differential, if, if we grow 15 tons of maize compared to an average three cuts of grass, I worked it out that it was less than 20% more expensive if, if you get that 15 tons off. <clears throat> Again, uh, the next one there, biggest cost, our biggest cost in farm is feed. Um, and we can't cut feed costs without good forage. You're not going to starve your way to a good profit. Uh, and uh, your, your key thing is high intakes of forage. You want good ME multiplied by good forage intakes so that you can replace some feed with, with forage. Uh, and I think it's important on that subject to measure forage intakes uh, uh, you know, especially when, when cows are indoors, it's, it's quite easy to uh, measure how much forage co uh, your, your cows are, are, are eating. Um, and the, the better farmers, the ones with the good milk and forage, it, it stands to reason, I know, but they're getting good intakes of forage. Uh, they have, they're not overcrowded in their sheds. They're, they're, they've got good... Uh, with plenty of feed space um, and the forage is pushed up and so on. And that's that's important too. And going back to the maize, when you have a second forage, I'm going into winter time here, perhaps, but or talking to maybe those who, who keep cows in full time, but the second forage does increase forage intakes as well. I'm not going to talk about the the the, the bottom two as such, it's not really relevant today. Uh, uh, it's the last one there, uh, lifetime yield, I find, is uh, we, we have quite often arguments back and forth about milk yield per cow. And all I would say about it is that lifetime yield per cow is, is most important, but it's not a subject for tonight. Um, the, ratios, uh, the ratios that we see uh, in, in farming, uh, this is in dairy farming now, uh, largely drive profit. So... Uh, and according to your feed rate, uh, but a lot of farmers here are, are in a feed rate of 0.3 and, and, and the indoor farmers are in 0.4. So a feed, an increase or decrease in 10 pound a ton will add or, or take off 
0.3 or 4p a liter off your bottom line. Um, and again, um, 100 pound a ton in fertilizer. I have noticed that uh, on a lot of farms now that that there are some as high as 10 tons of fertilizer on the farm. Since I sorry, the 10 tons of feed per one ton of fertilizer. I think maybe that would be at the top end. I think eight tons of feed uh, on a lot of dairy farmers now uh, to one ton of fertilizer. And the reason I mention this is that I think farmers talk and think too much about fertilizer costs and fertilizer prices when we should be concentrating on our feed costs. It's a much bigger, it's it's five, six times as much money spent on, on my client's farms on, on feed as there is in fertilizer. And I would say the amount of time talking about fertilizer prices is probably double that spent talking about feed prices. And, and we get focused on the wrong thing sometimes. Uh, and, uh, and some have cut fertilizer rates uh, uh, right down. And, and with an in, uh, with a an impact on forage quality, with an impact on on even empty pits and so on, on some places now. So we, we need to be careful, as Debbie was saying. Uh, we need to keep using the fertilizer. It's still, especially now with the price coming down, we don't want to be skimping on it. And and uh, I would encourage people to to. Uh, we, you know, there are a significant number of farmers now have their soil tests done and they have this information to fingertips you can correct your soil pHs and, and, and that maximize your your uh, <coughs> grass grown from vert, from fertilizer um, <clears throat> the milk to feed price ratio uh, Jerry touched on it earlier um, is very important for dairy farmers I looked up AHDB there today and uh, the five-year ruling average in England, uh, Great Britain I should say, is 1.23. I'm, I'm aware that their feed is, is, is less expensive than ours, but over, over a period of time you'll buy <clears throat> 1.23 tonnes uh, of feed for 1,000 litres of muck. Right now if we count 31p for, for May, it could be that May or June, uh, and 360 for feed, uh, we're, we're below, we're a, a ton of meal uh, costs more than a, a thousand litres of milk. Uh, so the, the environment we find ourselves in here is that we should not be pushing on. I think farmers have the signal anyway, uh, but the, the, the signal clearly is that uh, to be, again, to be trying to maximise your forage intakes. Um, when we look at forage intakes, in the house, you'll see you in the, when your cows are confined, you'll commonly see 10, 11 kilos of grass. As Debbie was saying, you might get 15, 16, perhaps at, in, in, at farm level, we could be a couple of kilos less. But I think when we're comparing the grass to silage, there might not be an awful difference in the cost of producing it. Uh, I think it was around 30% there, according to those figures we, we saw from Debbie. But when we look at feed intake, we look at forage intakes of grass. We're, we're, you know, this time of year in particular, we are quite a bit cows will eat quite a bit more forage if they're getting, if they're being grazed than if they're uh, indoors, and that's that along with the feed to milk price ratio is, it's a signal to try and get more cows out, uh, draw the line a bit higher. Um, the ratio needs to be well over one to pay to push on for milk. Um, and so we, the signal really at the minute is to, uh, if you like, to be, to be, to be, to be watching your forage intakes, watching your feed rates, and and looking carefully at your feed tables in your milk and parlor, uh, and 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 if your if your buffer feed or anything like that there is to make sure. Uh, that the lowest yielding cows aren't getting overfed. If, if I go onto a farm and I see uh, very high feed costs um, and you ask farmers uh, what's happening, they'll always tell you about the 50 litre cow and what she's eating and so on. But where the problems are is at the other extreme. It's the 12 litre, the 14 litre cow that probably shouldn't, at the moment, shouldn't even be there. Um, uh, 
or else you should be right off. Um, uh, uh, the, and she's perhaps getting three or four kilos in the wagon and a couple of kilos in the parlor. There's where your problem is. And if you're looking at, if your feed rate is too high, look at your low yielding cars. That's mostly where the problem is. Um, <clears throat> so the break even feed cost for dairy cows, uh, if we look at a, a scenario, I was looking at the other day, uh, someone was feeding 40 kilos of silage at 40 pounds a ton, eight kilos of, of, of feed altogether. So the break even uh, cost of feeding this cow was 18 litres. We, we had some incidental costs, fat costs and so on included in here, but it was 18 litre was her break even. She wasn't making any money at 18 litres. We put that cow out, outdoors and you get we can get her out day and night. Um, allowing 80 pound a ton, I think I'm a little lower than Debbie's figure there, but it's one pound 20 and two kilos, a kilo at night, a kilo in the morning, minimum was eight litres, so 10 litres difference. Uh, so uh, it, the cow, the, if the cow even dropped four or five litres going out, I'd say you're still better off. I know that's assuming she's getting all that meal indoors. She may not be. This is just an example, but it it it, it proves the point that that we have to be trying to do as much grazing as we can uh, at this point in time. I know the weather is difficult. I I've I've uh, I, and many haven't finished their their first like uh, the first rotation, but uh, in the real world, um, ground is soft in many places, um, and I. I only got finished in the first rotation uh, today myself, and I'm not proud of it, but uh, uh, many others would be in the same position and, and left too much grass behind because uh, it was getting the poaching and so on. But we have to uh, try to get things back into nor back into shape. When ground conditions allow, bring the baler in behind and get, get things tidied up. Um, better than using the topper, in my view, but um, hopefully the ground will dry up soon and we'll be able to do that. Just some observations. Uh, I, I found uh, quite often uh, a lot of dairy farmers complaining that uh, uh, cows get thin outside, getting thin. Um, and I, I found in some of these farms that actually what they're doing is they're not allocating enough grass, they're not, not allocating enough grass to these cows. In fact, one was as low as daytime grazing was only given cows three kilos access to three kilos of dry matter intake and I think it's important to uh, have a look or ask somebody at least who would know um, how much area um, and it depends on the obviously on your uh, on your on your grazing uh, how much grass you have in the paddock at the time uh, but uh, there's uh, the other thing that I think happens quite a lot and I see it is uh, some people are grazing half the herd and they're feeding maybe an 18 nut or, 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 or high, a high protein nut in the parlor and they're giving the cows too much protein causing them to lose condition over the summer and there's a couple of things that I would flag up to people um, to try to keep cows in better condition they need not lose condition at grass summertime that's that's a cause of a problem somewhere uh, and grazing is hard work, and many have given up, and 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 that is something that that I uh, uh, and many others we we uh, we would like to stop that trend, but um, it it uh, they're, they're, they, I have found that if we can encourage people to measure grass, which I know is a skill of itself. Uh, but we can produce, we have seen increase milk yields and increase in milk proteins. If, if you can, give it a go. Uh, grass measuring is a great tool to, to bring all this into shape. Um, and uh, it's not difficult. Uh, it, it, if you have a plate meter, you can just use it to even measure the next three or four paddocks that, that you're coming into, even if you don't want to go on agri-net or anything like that. But uh, the plate meter is a very useful tool at this, you know, in the summertime. Um, just a couple of things, because uh, I'm aware of an neglect of the beef and sheep uh, farmers here. Uh, at home here, we we are. Uh, uh, I would say last year uh, was a was a, a bit of a, a, a disaster for financially. Uh, we um, we uh, 
I mean, ran out of grass in late summer uh, and I fed a lot of meal to finish lambs and uh, it just didn't work out financially between the high fertilizer costs and the high feed costs. So I put in some multi-species sward last August and there it is there in the photograph. Um, I'm going to put some more in now in, 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 uh, in, uh, in a couple of weeks time. Um, I'm trying a couple of kilos of swift, uh, which is a rip, to try and finish lambs on no meal, to feed no meal. Uh, had multi-species before, three or four years ago. It worked well. It doesn't last too long. Didn't last long here. Uh, hopefully, uh, we, we, we can suffer a bit with it. We can suffer with wet weather here, and we can also get dry weather. Uh, and it's, it's uh, we kind of get, I think, the worst of both worlds a bit. But um, the, uh, I've just changed the, uh, the policy a bit with the sheep and didn't have any triplets in the field this year and no yo lambs went to the field with more than one and so far it's working uh, I'm very happy with the multi-species um, it's grown back really well um, I've given it one small dressing of, of fertilizer only uh, about half a bag same as and um, uh, might get some slurry later we're also paddock raising heifers uh, for a dairy farmer, and that is a, a that's a, a, we, we do that in three day, two days and three day paddocks. We rotate them every 18, 21 days, just like so many others are doing. So, uh, but I think the the lesson for me in 2022 was that I need to be concentrating on 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 on, a, on finishing my sheep and my lambs on on forage and getting away from meal altogether because it, with high feed costs and lamb prices being where they were I'm not uh, uh, I don't I'm not convinced there's sustainable profit in it um, so uh, that's pretty much my uh, presentation over there uh, Jerry or Jason if you want to take thanks, over uh, thanks Jason and again I think there's a lot of information there um, to reflect on and I guess one thing that struck me was uh, it's an old adage but an important one and we're all guilty of this I think when we see prices increasing we tend to confuse um, price for value and I think it's particularly true in the case of uh, is, the, is the grass and the quality of that grass that can be produced and and it's important that I think we're saying we shouldn't have knee-jerk reactions. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting in contrast uh, with um, Debbie's presentation, and hopefully it'll come up in questions. And again, I remind you all uh, the the audience to use the Q and A box uh, because we'll be shortly moving over to a Q and A session now with both Debbie and um, and Jason. Um, but Jason also. I, I thought it was very useful to look at a longer term strategy in terms of maximizing utilization of, of grass in the most cost efficient way. Uh, and the focus on clover and multi species wards, on reseeding, uh, again, on raising the issue about maize, which certainly may be suitable in certain circumstances, as opposed to the importance also of the short term fixes, um, such as liming and weed control and so on application. Uh, so I think it, farmers need to be mindful of what the tactical concerns when you're dealing with tight margins and then the longer run strategic perspective. Now, um, Jason Rankin is going to handle the Q&A so for the two papers. So I'll hand over to you, Jason. Okay, thank you very much, Jerry. And again, a reminder just to, to put the questions in as they come along in the Q&A box. And the first question for yourself, Debbie, is just asking about those uh, end response uh, curves uh, from the, the grass check plots and was most of the low rate of N applied in the spring? And maybe I'll ask you to tie into that, you know, any comments you want to make on that kind of long-term response in terms of trying to get to the legumes in the sword, either through clover swords or as Jason McGuinn said, um, multi-species swords. Uh, any particular thoughts on that? You're muted, Debbie. 
Thanks, Jason. Um, so the question on the lower rates of nitrogen being applied to, uh, was most of the nitrogen applied in spring? Um, and just correct me if I'm wrong here, Jason, because you might be closer to this uh, project now than myself, um, but I think it was evenly spread for the 135 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, the 67.5. Jason, can you confirm? Am I, am I understand, my understanding is that it's, 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 it's spread across as you would expect yeah. in a normal grass year. So the kind of yeah. proportions you would get so there is more in spring but it doesn't just it doesn't all in spring and that just stops so it's kind of done in proportion to what you'd get with the the two uh, so each application the 270 which obviously is higher in spring and lesser as the season goes on basically that's split in half and then half again so that's my understanding okay. of how that okay. one's done Perfect. Thanks, Jason. And then on the clover side of things and longer term, I think there's some really nice research coming out of Chugas at the minute showing, you know, really that if we have swords which are 25 to 30 percent clover, they can supply, you know, upwards of 100 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. And if that was managed correctly, when we talk about the cost of producing um, for like our cost of producing forages, that can reduce your grazing and silage costs anywhere sort of between 10 and 20 pounds a ton um, of dry matter. So there, there is a role there um, for sourcing um, some of that extra nitrogen from clover. It's then about understanding how we can really effectively manage those systems uh, well to get the most out of that clover. I think when it comes to multi-species swords, certainly what we've seen last year is you know, the role that they can certainly play in filling a forage gap um, in those drought conditions. Um, what we need to understand more of them now is how they work in dairy systems in particular, um, uh, what species in the sward can really contribute the best to improved animal performance, and as well, can they grow the yields that we need them to grow um, without the same levels of nitrogen input? So Thank a lot you. of questions to be answered. Moving on then, um, Jason, Jason, I know you mentioned slurry bugs. Uh, have you seen any analysis from slurry through the slurry bugs? And, you know, does have you seen any improvements in, uh, in available nitrogen? Also, maybe just a, a, another comment uh, that's come in is, you know, there, despite the reduction in fertilizer prices, considerable reduction this spring, sales haven't seemed to increase so far. But are you, are you picking that up? And what do you think the obstacles are to to getting fertilizer our, uh, application rates up where somewhere new or than it used to be. Um. Uh, okay. The slurry. The slurry bugs first, Jason. Um. Sampled around twenty five farms. Um. There. Uh. At the at the end of the around the beginning of February when people started to mix. Um. And we did see available nitrogen up as high as twenty one. Uh, units per thousand gallons. Uh, I think that the standard is is a ten or nine or ten or something like this is the book value in RB two and nine. So um, it wasn't universal, um, and uh, I suppose I'm not going to mention names or anything. But uh, there, there, yeah, I'm, I'm. I think there's got a role to play, and, and particularly where people put the bugs on good and early and put them on at the proper rate and kept them away from the parlor and the parlor washings and all that, the copper sulfate and so on. The second question there um, slurry on the fertilizer uh, sales is uh, there's a significant amount of people who, who bought a lot of fertilizer last September, October through the winter time. I wonder, I just wonder if you analyze through say sales from the beginning of September through to maybe December, January, if if were they more than average? Because I, I think there, there were a lot a lot of fertilizer bought early. And it's not those people aren't in the market yet. That's a that's a very good point. Uh John Egerton, Debbie May for you raises a, a very, very good point, which given the recent weather conditions and many people having a, a deja vu back to, to what happened in the middle of May last year. What do you do in wet conditions? If silage is ready to be cut, do you wait for dry conditions or do you go ahead in broken weather? So it's that dry matter versus digestibility argument. Oh, quite, uh, Jason, that's a billion dollar question isn't it, that everybody's asking. Yeah, I think I think it's a really challenging one to answer and it depends on what a couple of things. Firstly, what the forage is for. So what type of animal you're feeding, how important is that really high energy value forage in the system? It's then about if we do need high quality forage and here 
in perfect conditions, the more we can get high quality forage, the better. But when we are balancing that against low dry matter grasses, you know, it is a challenge uh, to, to get. So it's if we are going to cut um, w when dry matters are slightly lower than uh, what we would like, it's how we then manage that plant to make sure that we are getting the best will possible if there is a will to be had um, and uh, you know that we're trying to optimize the silage making procedure to sort of ensure that we get the best quality stuff in it um, you know additives some people will look towards additives to try and protect against uh, low dry matter silages uh, additives will go may contribute and help a little bit within silage process but will not turn a poor silage into a good silage so we've just got to bear that in mind um, as well so here yeah, very challenging one there isn't there I think it's very hard one to answer um, really because it is very much a balance um, um, but uh, you know and we have to weigh that up Jason I don't know if you have any uh other comments on that um no at i think as uh, i i think i agree with you 100 <laughs> percent. okay uh, and I'll, I'll combine these last two questions and that will do it for this part of the session you can again ask questions and we can catch them up at the end but um uh, and i mean again i'll ask debbie first but jason you feel free to come in too uh, is there a role for silage additives in improving winter forage at silage making stage? You know, so what's 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 the silage? What's the latest science in silage additives? And then I was also advised to ensure that two thirds of my nitrogen should be applied by the end of May. Does this hold still hold true? Okay, so just taking the first one there on silage additives, uh, Jason, there has been um, ranges of research done on silage additives over the years although i would say it's been there there's probably a requirement for for more work um to be done silage additives do play different roles um depending on the type of the silage additives some of them are geared towards helping with that initial fermentation process so they will help drop the ph initially um they will help move the silage towards creating more um, uh, lactic acid to, to really um, try and ensure that a good fermentation is reached. Then there are other types of silage additives and silage bugs, which are more focused on tackling the yeasts and the molds that will develop um, when silage isn't stable. So when we have, um, when the silage hasn't been properly consolidated, for example, when it's very dry, um, but then we can get a lot of yield, uh, yeast and mold growth and that then means that we don't have stable silages when we open the clamps. So silage additives do different things in terms of whether they have an effect or not is dependent on whether you're using the right bugs and the right additives for what you want to do and what your potential issue is. Some results out there have been shown that, you know, silage additives can reduce dry matter losses about 6% in some cases, um, but results across studies have been quite variable so i think really when it comes to silage additives it's about looking if you think you are going to have an issue it's about looking as to what the likely problem is going to be if you've struggled with stability in the past looking for additives that can help inhibit, inhibit yeast and mold growth or if you struggle to get a, a good fermentation looking at silage additives which help drop the ph um, are important some of them also worth looking at in terms of how long they take to work if you're intending to open the clamp after two or three weeks um, there are some that take a longer period of time for the bugs and bacteria to work so we need to look at that um, and the other thing that I would say is silage additives uh, as I mentioned earlier don't cover um, uh, don't make up for poor in silage practices so where we can reduce in soil contamination of the swords getting in a good dry silage in there um, getting high levels of sugar um, in the silage is all contribute towards and getting good consolidation in the clamp all contri contribute and are the cornerstones of actually getting good silage and reducing the need for an additive. In terms of fertilizer application, if we look at the application uh, of the grass growth curve, what we can typically see is our peak grass growth months are May, June and July. That is also the time of the year when grass, um, when soil and nitrogen supplies are the lowest. Soil and nitrogen supplies tend to be highest later in the year in August, uh, September time, as the increase in soil temperature encourages more nitrogen to be mineralized from the soil. So we 
previously have always had a weighting towards higher levels of nitrogen application at the start of the year because that is when there is the biggest demand for it from the plant and then uh, that's when there's less of it available in the soil. So yes, that still holds true. Okay, thank you. Jason, have you anything to add to that? Um, well, all I would say is that, uh, I mean, Debbie's been involved in the sharp end of the research. Um, I, uh, the silage additive, uh, on the silage additive issue, um, I've had, a, I think I think there are other things that play a big role in in the in the silage making stage. Um, I mean, if we look recently, the, a major problem we've seen is silage slippage, and uh, possibly due to consolidation of the clamp and how fast it's going in and so on, and even just the dry matter. Um, and I would be I think those things would be higher up my list than than, than which additive to use. But um, I used to be. Uh, I used to be I used to be a Kingsay uh, consultant, and uh, they did a lot of research on it. And they were never convinced about 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 size out of. Um, uh, and uh, I I'm not quite sure myself. I've had a few clients who won the grassland competition and didn't use it, but they they, they uh, 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 so um, I, I would sit on the fence as far as sales out is concerned. Um, but I would be very, I think, I think some people, I think we need to be careful about how the sale is go, the grass goes in and gets covered and so on, that end of things. Okay, thank as, you. As far as fertilizer uh, in by, late, by the end of May, I think it would be two thirds of the fertilizer on the end of May would be, the condition would have to be that you'd have to have your first cut, you need to be putting your second cut on. Uh, it wouldn't hold true perhaps maybe for grazing, uh, uh, not in a grazing situation, perhaps it would be right enough for a three cup silage. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, both. And I'll pass over now to Sinclair to chair the next session. Okay, thank you very much, Jason, and uh, good evening, uh, everyone. And particular thanks to Debbie and uh, Jason McMinn for giving us an excellent introduction into the importance of high quality forage. Uh, and as we all know, good grassland management is challenging at the best of times and particularly challenging this year with the variable uh, spring weather conditions that we've been facing. So I'm delighted that we're now going to talk to three farmers across the province. We're going to do a tour uh, from Balamani through Kirkcubbon and finish up in uh, Kilkeel. But we've, we've changed the order a little bit and the intention is that we'll, we'll start with the beef side, first of all, with uh, with Sam and Kirkcubbon, and then move on to uh, Gary uh, Thompson from Balamani and finish off with Jim, Jim Henderson uh, from Kilkeel. So I think now is a really good chance to just learn from the experiences of others because every year is different. And I think grassland management, the one thing I've learned is we're always learning uh, and always need to learn to, to make the, the, the best of grass. So, Sam, um, thank you very much for joining the, the panel discussion. We'll start with you. Can, can you give us a brief background on your farm and farming system, and then we'll move into the grass side, please? Uh, thank you, Sinclair. Yeah, we have a suckler cow to beef system and also a flock of breeding ewes, um, which all spring calving, um, and they all calve very, very sharply this year, which meant we had 120 cows and calves in the shed when they should have been in the field. So we've had a very hard spring. Sheep are all lambed, but lamb a proportion in September and the rest of them lamb in January. So how have you managed with the, with the late spring? I mean, the one thing I've noticed is grass growth has actually maintained fairly well. There was a bit of a dip in late, late April, but looking at the grass check uh, growth, you know, it's pretty well on, on target. The problem is being able to use it. So. Uh, have you been able to get out and, and make use of, of grass as far as possible? Well, we outwintered um, 50 heifers on turnips uh, and stubble turnips and kale. And uh, they, they were flying, but come the 1st of March, they were housed because it just got too wet. And we've actually only today, we released 30 cows and calves off the stubble turnip ground uh, on the grass because we were just too wet. And we're still too wet. Some of our fields um, are just about passable and no more to sow fertilizer on. We've got dribs and drabs of fertilizer out as quick as we could get it out. Our grass covers are built really well now, um, but we're moving cows and calves very quickly. 
They're not getting their three days in a paddock. They're getting, you know, we're, we're, we're stalking lightly. We're moving quickly. We're going, going into high covers and coming out of high covers because um, we don't really want to poach or tramp. Um, the sheep really have got a, a free run. Um, they've done exceptionally well. Um, a, a good third of our lambs are ready to go now um, with no concentrate feeding at all. So our, our lambs have done well. Our, cal- our calves are looking very well. Um, if, if a wee bit warm now because muggy, clammy weather, um, the grass has started to grow now. This week we grew, I think it was 69 kilos. Uh, so it's stepping up week on week. We have a lot of herbal lays in, with a lot of red clovers in, um, a lot of clover swords going in. Um, and we're hoping to put a bit of loose stern in um, come June time. So we're trying to mix it up because last year we grew nothing for two months of the year. And the only green fields we had were red clover fields and herbal lay fields, mixed species sword fields rather. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what we're trying to do here. There, Singer. And what about silage? Then have have you uh, have have you moved? Have you had to graze some of the silage area, or are you still managing to keep that separate? No, we've kept that separate. The silage, the silage looks really well. Um, albeit it's got very little fertilizer this year. It's got a bag of a bag of urea, um, and got slurry very early on. It was slurry at the beginning of February, uh, and a bag of urea. Is, the silage probably should be cut, but we're not going to cut it because it's just too delicate the ground just too delicate our contract is, is going mad because he's getting tractor stuck trailer stuck uh, pickup stuck uh it's not worth it um i sometimes doubt i know i know debbie was talking about this early good early silage um all my dairy farm neighbors all of them have been drawing silage at 60 pound a ton into the yard for the last mm, month and a half two months i could have sold the surplus silage i have in my yard a dozen times, um, so sometimes, um, sometimes um, a wee bit of caution maybe um, needs to be, or maybe too many cows. And last question then, Sam. Uh, these heavy covers that you're having to come out of early and not able to graze them down because of wet conditions. What? How are you going to manage them? I mean, how are you going to get those down? Is the plan to graze them down at the next grazing, or is that where the sheep come in, or or how do you yeah. how do you get those covers yeah. down? That's exactly the way we, we graze a mixed species sward, um, skirt of tramping it, took the cows out, put the sheep in. The sheep have, have, have took the tops of it. The sheep have been right around the whole farm, basically taking the tops of a lot of grass. Um, we're going in at 33, 3400, coming out at 20, 20, 2100. Um, and yeah, well, we'll, if needs be, we'll put the sheep in. If needs be, we'll put bull and heifers in, uh, some light, light stuff that that don't really require the, the quality that uh, to produce milk or something like, like that there. And I don't like taking I don't like taking paddocks out because I've failed them. I've failed. I've got to um, get the animal to graze it if possible in situ. And um, we don't make very many bales. We make red clover bales for to increase our protein and our silages. Um, we're, we're like an I have an ME silage, but we're we're making red clover bales at 19, 20 percent protein. Uh, and just what Jason said about you know um, different varieties of forage, we have three different forages in our in our bull beef mix, and uh, you know um, some bulls are doing one point nine a day, some bulls are doing one point six a day, and um, you know it's they're, they're performing and it's mostly on forage. Okay, at least you're in the fortunate position. You have light stock to come in behind. I mean that's a a lot of people aren't in that position. So yeah. thanks very much, Sam. We're we're a bit limited on time. So. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll move up north now, uh, up to Balamone, and uh, uh, thanks very much for joining us, Gary, and uh, pleased you could could uh, join in. And I know, again, you're on the dairy side, so I see a bit of silage cut up that way the last couple of weeks, but uh, can you give us a bit of background on, on your farming system, please, and then we'll talk through the, the challenges of this season. Thanks, Sinclair. Uh, yeah, we're near Balamone, a couple of hundred cows, um, four and a half butter fat, three and a half protein. We're about the nine to nine and a half thousand litre mark and aim the calves from September through to January. Um, we mostly grassland based and um, 30 acres or 12 hectares for uh, cereals. Um, I tend to use Timothy and all my seeds, um, which is not particularly common and um, multi-species swords will be off and so on for um, particularly grazing um, swords. And how have you found this spring? Have you had the same challenges that we've all faced in terms of 
uh, wet conditions? Yeah, it's, it's been really difficult. And um, I find that uh, we, we applied slurry, slurry quite late. February was a dry month and a lot of neighbours went quite early, but we held on and I like to use, get the slurry on towards the end of, of February or beginning of March, mainly because the, it's, it's so cold and wet, usually the grass can't utilise the, the nutrients within it. And then came the challenge of when to put the fertiliser on because um, was it to go early enough and get and fertiliser on, I felt we were losing growth, but the challenge was that we couldn't travel on the ground. So to put fertiliser on too early, then uh, we were marking, marking, uh, marking the ground, which is really simply the tractor and fertiliser sore, and then we were forced into rolling, but covers were getting too heavy. So I avoided that. Uh, I've only got fertiliser on uh, for a silage three weeks ago. Um, and yeah, I, I avoided, I just rolled the outside of the fields and avoided rolling the centre of the fields. We've taken um, 50 acres out for uh, grazing and added some heavy covers from the reseeds last year that were growing whole crop in with uh, peas in the mix. So. I think there's probably residual nitrogen there that had helped grow on that sward from, from early on. But um, yeah, we, we, we've been really late and it's only really received 40, 40 units of uh, nitrogen in the form of uh, urea and a sulphur mix. What about grazing? How's that been going? Um... We've, we've just started our, our second rotation. The grazing, um, grazing was, uh, they're out just over uh, two weeks. We we'll start second rotation covers are light, but given the heat, uh, it's there and expected ever to bounce. And because of taking out silage last week, I've had an extra uh, 20 acres to pull into the grazing rotation. We've really only half the cows out at the minute, the other half that's in our um, 35, 40 litre animals. I just don't think are suitable for the conditions at the minute. Um, or, or there's a few late PDs still yet. I don't, I don't tend to turn them out till there's about 60, 60 days in calf. But um, young stock has also been a challenge because by the time we got them out, the covers were heavy, and then we've pulled out um, silage from then to to try and get uh, something to put, um, you know, regrowth coming to get something to put them onto um, now. But uh, we didn't so hunt on any fertilizer in the grazing until we had it um, grazed once. So as soon as it was grazed, it was immediately fertilized, but um, covers were, were just so strong. We're out on the 20th of April, around that mark, and generally that would be the time of year we would get out up here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And having used a lot less fertilizer this spring, is your plan to sow more now um, after first cut, or you know, how, how are you going to make up the grass growth that obviously hasn't uh, that you haven't got with, with the fertilizer going on at a lower level and later than normal? I'm not convinced. I'm not entirely convinced that we have lost a massive amount of dry matter um, intake because it's easy to see what, what other people have done in the area and they've gone early with fertilizer, but it's, it's bruised the it's bruised the grass because we've had to row it and the cold, mm -hmm. we'd cook some quite late harsh frost. So that's damaged it. And, um, and my swords are ready for cutting now, which is traditionally on moral show week, the, the, you know, the second week of, of May is, is, you know, that's an early cut of silage. So um, swords are starting to go down. They're so heavy. I'm not convinced that uh, we are actually going to be lacking in, in dry matter at all. Um, so enough, we had, just need to get it cut really now yeah. is the key thing. So you had enough residual nitrogen over the winter to, to and, and with the slurry going on to some extent to, to give enough growth? So yeah, enough... well, we were one of uh, Jason's clients that had tried a, a slurry bug and got it tested and we had uh, fairly high levels of nitrogen within the slurry. So because it was late, it was late application of slurry on the end of February, beginning of March, it, it really had... Um, you know, it, it was able to do its work and we didn't lose a lot of that. Um, it went on good conditions and dry conditions and it was, I think the grass was able to utilise that quite well, so. So the immediate future, the priority is weather permitting, presumably silage, cutting silage, 
is that is that the plan? And then um, getting back onto a normal grazing rotation is is that the priority from from here on? Yeah, um, get get the silage in. We'd, we'd also signed on the grazing point of view. We're also signed up to a meadow crop. Unfortunately, it hasn't um, come off. Whereby they were hoping to measure grass from uh, infrared satellite uh, data. Um, but yeah, I think we're we're going to be back into normal. Um, I think I, I think we'll be all right. The, the problem at the minute is just getting the remainder of the herd out, um, and it's extra workload that creates wet weather. It's just it's, it's just extra work, and, and you put an extra thirty four percent work load on on a time of year that should be, uh, particularly in autumn, winter cabin dairy herd should be easy easy to manage. Just milk the cows and turf them in the field, but. Um, yeah, it just adds more complexity and challenge that you can really do without. So, I mean, it's one of the things that we often overlook, the stress of a difficult grazing season. You know, we uh, I think it's un underestimated how much stress it causes, cause an extra work it causes at farm level. Uh, I think it's only those who are involved really know the, the challenges, and you're quite right to highlight that. Thanks very much, Gary. Um, we'll move uh, south then to Kilkeel, and we're joined by James Henderson. <coughs> James, again, you're on the beef and sheep side. Uh, very welcome. Can you give us a bit of background on, on, on your farm, first of all, and then we'll talk through the grazing and silage side? Okay, th th thank you, Sinclair, and uh, good evening, everyone. I, I've been asked to lean towards the, the sheep side tonight. Sam has touched mostly on the beef, but we have uh, a lowland flock of about 250 uh, ewes, lamb and down March, April, and uh, replacements also go to the ram. And then I also have a dairy calf to beef system where we buy in about 80 uh, bottom born calves and take them through to beef at about 20, 24 months. Um, the farm is largely um, perennial ryegrass based systems, but both enterprises are very much grass based and in, in finishing our stock. Um, the land is, is relatively free draining. We, we're in paddock systems for both um, beef and sheep. And um, we have a little bit of multi species, and we have some red clover in as well. And how has the spring been? You, you said you're fairly free draining. Have, have you had less of a challenge with the weather this year? Has it or... well, pr pr probably, Sinclair, yes, maybe more, less of a challenge than maybe some of the folks who are, who are listening in. Um, Sam touched on the fact that the sheep and, and um, are not doing the same damage, and we've got away well there now. Over lambing time, just with March being a quite a difficult month, they had to stay in an extra day or two. Um, but we, we had plenty of, of straw for ourselves and good hygiene, and that didn't matter. But I know on the beef side of things, there has been a wee bit of damage to swords, but we've had to move them on when we didn't get them grazed out the way we'd have liked to have done. But uh, yes, the, the, the majority of, of the land, because of, of on, on sheep side, We've got away well, and we'll have good clean grazing out of, of each part. Okay. And what about fertilizer use? Uh, historically, have you been on the low side, or and, and how has that changed with the increase in fertilizer price in the last two years? Well, we, we had been fairly highly stuck. I think our last benchmark and figures were talking about two point eight eight um, livestock units per hectare. But la last year, and um, with the the, the, the price of fertilizer rising, we reduced our stocking rate a little bit and we also reduced our fertilizer usage somewhat. Um, we were we were testing ground every year for pH and P and K, just maybe 25% last year. I tested the whole farm and made sure everything was corrected so that then whenever I did apply fertilizer, I was maximizing the usage. And one of the other things we're doing, and I know dairy farmers can't do it. But because we have a low loading value, we're, we're able to import um, slurry, and that, that has pr proved invaluable. We're setting about 142 kilograms um, of nitrogen per hectare, and for our farm, that means an importing about 100,000 gallons of, of cattle slurry from a neighbour. So th that has um, helped a whole lot just in reducing our, our, our fertiliser bill. Okay, and and uh, you haven't you've not uh, been able to keep grass growth, maintain grass growth, and so on by replacing the fertilizer with with slurry. 
Yeah, well, most Which of the slurry would be going on to the si the silage ground. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's it's improving our fertility. It's mean we're having to buy a lot less P and K mm -hmm. in in artificial fertilizer, and, and that has has been a saving. Yeah, and I know James, you're you do a lot of uh, grass grass sword measurement. Uh, yeah. Is that something you've been doing this year, and and how are the figures stacking up compared to other years? I mean, grass growth. Jason just sent me through the grass check figures there, and uh, earlier today, uh, grass growth is is really shooting ahead with the warm conditions this week. I think it's close to eighty kilos, so it's 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 uh, within a couple of weeks of probably being peak growth, and and certainly in the drier parts of the country. Yeah, well, you certainly our. Our farm, the month of May, uh, grass growth is, is at its peak there. And uh, as, as you mentioned, the, the whole um, measuring of grass, and Jason touched on the importance of it in his presentation. Um, we're out on, on a weekly basis, and I have a number of paddocks where we have surpluses. And because of that surplus, um, I, I can then uh, set that aside from the point of view of on a free drain and land, we, we could have a deficit very easily. In, in the month of July. So it's again utilizing the grass as the best we can. And, and I suppose with the, the paddock grazing system, we have that flexibility to do that when we're when we're measuring and we have the confidence to, to take out the surpluses. Yeah. Do you take those surpluses out as, as main cut silage or have you flexibility with big bales to a big bale system to come in and, and take out individual paddocks? Well, we would take out individual paddocks on, on a regular basis. Um, if it tied in with our various cuts of silage, we would ensile it in the pit as well. But I'm happy to take out big bales. And rather than do maybe five or six paddocks at a time, I could do two or three this week and two or three next week so that I still have a, a grass wedge that is like a set of stairs. And, and mm. that's important as well, you know. And that frequent grass measurement allows you to identify those surpluses and, and uh, as you maintain the wedge then right through the year? Yes, yes, very much so. Yeah. Very good. I see Jerry back on screen, so that probably means my, my time is up, uh, Jerry. And maybe just if we had time for, for one question, Jerry, I was maybe going to go back to, and thanks very much, uh, James. I was going to quick one on uh, to back to Sam in terms of Sam and, and um, Gary to some extent as well. Your your multi species swords, Sam. Um, how have they fared this in a wet spring uh, in comparison to a traditional ryegrass sword? Have you seen any differences? No, not really, not really. Um, we've a, a few more weeds than we normally would have, um, but we were we were very quiet on them. Actually, we moved them every two days. Um, didn't graze too hard at them. The sheep are in now taking the tops of what is left. Um, but no, no, um, with plenty, a good dry field when, when, when with plenty of, of multi species to eat. Like we had it right into October and left it to um, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we had a good turnout of it so far, but we can't go back for 30 days. That's the only problem with multi species. It doesn't really fit into the rotation. Yeah. Okay. Gary, have, have you any comment on the multi-species? Um, uh, uh, you've, you've started to, to use some, I think, as well. Um, not really. So the multi-species, I had a number of, uh, it's a good few years since I originally put them in, and, and a lot of them, they just don't tend to last. You get four or five years, and the, the varieties disappear, disappear out now. My grazing museum was they were just in the, the standard rotation and, and um, getting a lesser amount of fertilizer, but certainly, um, fertilizer to drive them on. We do have, um, still have quite a lot of uh, clover within the swords, but I mean, they just don't stand the, the abuse that comes from uh, this sort of weather that just gets trumped. I mean, you just don't, don't hack the abuse of trumping out. It is why I'm using a lot of, um, I put about a kilo of, of Timothy in, and yeah, that root mass does. I find modern ryegrass swords can be quite open. Um, and that uh, Timothy just does fill it out there and puts a root mass on the surface to help help in these sort of weather conditions. So, okay, okay. Well, I think that's that's probably us for time. So, thanks very much, um, Gary and James. And I'll hand back to, yeah. to Jerry. Thanks again. Thank you, Sinclair, and to your excellent panel. Just a, a few words by way of uh, thank yous and conclusion. Uh, first of all. Um, 
there's a, a, a feedback survey, an online feedback survey. If you get a chance, um, we'd appreciate you filling it out. Also, Jason has put up on the screen there some forthcoming events that you may be interested in, in attending. The, the, the most immediate one is on the 24th of May. Um, so it just leaves me to, to first of all, thank you, um, the audience for your attendance virtually this evening. There was a great turnout and it just shows the appetite that there is for um, the provision of, of information uh, in a, hopefully in, in, a, in a timely manner that can help farmers at the coalface, so to speak. I'd, I'd like on your behalf to, to thank all of our speakers. First of all, uh, Debbie McConnell and Jason McMinn for their presentations and indeed for you or the audience's participation in the Q&A. And I think it was very important that uh, we had the views or heard the views of uh, three practicing farmers. Um, because I think that complement with research and, con and consultancy perspectives um, is, is really important. So I want to thank Gary Thompson and Sam Chesney and James Henderson. And of course, you Sinclair for uh, your excellent facilitation. Um, this event, of course, wouldn't have happened without the uh, excellent team uh, we have here in AgriResearch. In particular, I want to acknowledge the work of Jensen Rankin and Gillian Hoy in uh, organizing this evening's event. And indeed, I think it's important as several mentions have been made of grass check. And of course, we're hugely appreciative for those grass check farmers that supply the information week in, week out uh, to help all farmers improve the grassland management. And finally, to you all, I want you all to, uh, uh, to enjoy uh, Balmordel. Hopefully the weather will get a bit better uh, for, for that event. So thank you and good evening and safe home. Thank you. Bye.